The next chapter of the ancient city deals with the law of succession, the law of inheritance, of transfer of property from one generation to the next. As you go through it, two things to keep in mind. First, the law of inheritance follows directly from the law of property, and both of them are derived from the requirements of this ancient religion. Property exists only for the sake of perpetuating the offerings at the sacred fire that are necessary for the spirits of the ancestors to be at rest. Because the property only exists for that religious reason, the law of inheritance follows that religious requirement. Property can only be inherited by a person who is qualified under the laws of the religion to continue the offerings at the family fire. And that means the son and most frequently the eldest son. And so Fustel says, we can understand in light of this ancient religious requirement, some of the elements of later legal practice and legal standards that might seem unintelligible to us, that even seemed unfair and unnatural to later generations of Romans and Greeks, specifically the disadvantage that daughters were placed under with regard to inheriting property and the right of primogeniture, the unique privilege of the eldest son in inheriting property to the disadvantage of the later sons. These things make sense, Fustel says, if we read them in light of the lingering influence of this ancient religion on the sentiments and uh, prejudices of the people. The second thing to pay attention to is the illustration of Fustel's methods that we get in this chapter. His method, he tells us quite explicitly here, is to acknowledge that we have no texts prior to a certain point that will inform us of what legal standards or practices were like in the uh, lost former ages. But by looking at the legal documents we do possess from later ages and certain telling details in these, we can infer what the practices and laws of previous ages must have been. His uh, specific use of this with respect to Roman law in this chapter, I think, is as good an illustration that, as you'll get in a short space of Fustel's historical method. Keep in mind, he's not trying to prove decisively or deductively that such an ancient religion must have existed. He's building a case that believing in the existence of such an ancient religion allows us to make sense of what otherwise would be unintelligible, confusing, or arbitrary among practices and legal standards of later ages. So that's what to look for in Book 2, Chapter 7 of The Ancient City. The next video will be the text of that chapter. It's a little over a half hour long. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks for watching today. Goodbye.